Hello again. As we all know, one of the great challenges in this business is getting to grips with a new piece of equipment. Unfortunately, that's been the problem for me over the last few days, and I've reported, uh, recorded several pieces of video, none of which have had any audio on them. So that's been a bit of a disappointment. And I'm now in a situation where I have to give you a pricey of the work that I've been doing on the Type 78 receiver over the last few days. So I'm sorry about that, but um, I can't really do, redo the work. That doesn't quite work like that. Anyway, I'll start with the knobs. These have come up quite nicely. And we'll just adjust this here a bit. Right. Um, these are the knobs off the Type 78. Uh, they've all been cleaned with shellite and then given a uh, careful but generous coating of um, epoxy enamel, a black satin epoxy enamel, and they've come up quite nicely. So that's a step in the right direction. The uh, epoxy enamel's got a very long half-life and it should last pretty well for well beyond my time, I hope. Uh, the second piece of good news is with the front panel. Now I said in the first uh, session that um, screen printed panels don't really lend themselves terribly well to being uh, refurbished or restored and I stand by that unless you've got a particularly um, a deft hand for lettering uh, with a fine brush um, it's best not to attempt that too far and um, what I've done with this is I've actually masked off the lettering uh, with electrical tape and um, then sprayed the entire panel with epoxy enamel. Then while the paint was still wet, I very carefully removed all of the uh, electrical tape, one piece at a time, and using a very fine brush, uh, feathered out the epoxy enamel around the lettering with the result that the uh, borders of where the tape was laid in are now actually a bit hard to see. You have to look fairly closely to be able to see them. So that seems to have worked, especially after a couple of layers of uh, clear um, lacquer. So that should protect the work for a little while. And um, I think you'll agree that's not a bad outcome for something that's 80 years old. And um, not ex entirely in my personal skill set, but it can be done. Okay. Onto the radio itself, and I'm pleased to report that this has actually been surprisingly straightforward in many respects. Um, the first thing I did when I turned my attention to the chassis proper uh, was that I took a two inch brush, and I've said frequently that brushes are only for cleaning, not for painting. Um, and so I basically just dusted out the entire chassis, every nook and cranny that I could find, and then went over it again. Once I'd done that and I was satisfied that I'd re removed all the loose material, I then went through the chassis with contact cleaner. Now that might seem like a strange thing to do, but contact cleaner uh, dries very quickly. It doesn't leave a residue but you can flush out very fine particles of material and you can remove any sort of surface grease and that sort of thing. And of course, you go through all the switch contacts while you're at it. You go through the switch contacts, then basically flush the chassis out. And you've got a nice clean chassis after that. So I've gone into every nook and cranny with the, uh, the contact cleaner as well. Um, it's a, a little bit wasteful on the contact cleaner, I suppose. That's a about a $14 can and I've used probably just a touch over half of it but considering the age of the radio and what I'm trying to achieve with it that's a reasonable trade-off there's enough there to do another project or a good part of another project. The other good thing about contact cleaning is that you can use it on delicate components. Now the one of the, the most concerning aspects of this radio is this dial face. Now this is a fairly complex dial face. It's made of plastic which means that you don't want to use any kind of aggressive chemicals on it or indeed any kind of aggressive techniques whatsoever. I wouldn't even use a toothbrush on this 
um, I might use a, a light brush of this type to remove dust and so on but after I'd done that I basically sprayed this fairly thoroughly with contact cleaner and flushed any loose or greasy material off it and it's now reasonably clean um, clean enough to be uh, clearly legible and that was satisfactory uh, the next thing I did was to go around all the controls and there's a switch here and a potentiometer there and another one there and a couple of shaft drive shafts here I went round all of those with WD-40 and freed them up a bit a couple of them were squeaking some of them felt a little stiff uh, but the WD-40 tends to take care of that now these are slow rotating shafts which means that the only thing they don't really require a lot in the way of lubrication that they do need to be clean if they've got grit in them they'll squeak and grind and, and wear and this sort of thing and then um, on the dial mechanism I don't know whether you can see it at this resolution but this dial face is actually a gear it's got fine teeth all the way around it and it meshes into the gear on the control shaft just here so this is the master oscillator uh, frequency adjustment it's got a toothed gear on the back of it that uh, uh, meshes in with the rotating dial face and you can see the movement there so that shaft in there got a bit of WD-40 because I don't have access to the inside of the oscillator compartment that's a step too far unless there's something wrong with it and then once I was satisfied that it was clear and clean and free I applied this substance to it now this is a 3-in-1 lithium grease it's a very high quality grease you use it on um, bicycle gears and that sort of thing a very uh, long half-life very good life expectancy and um, it's compatible with pretty much pretty much any surface you can use it on any kind of gear plastic bronze brass steel anything you want and uh, it won't um, it won't damage the surfaces of the gears or the mechanisms okay um, on the rear of the radio we've got the Jones connector now this is a fairly heavy duty sort of a connector these teeth uh, are about a quarter of an inch wide and possibly a bit under an eighth of an inch thick so they're, they're fairly solid um, but they were pretty badly tarnished and uh, rather than um, mess about with them too much I used a comparatively aggressive tool uh, which is a uh, brass bristle brush so brass on brass or brass on bronze or whatever um, it's not going to do a great deal of damage um, using a brush like this will do as much damage to the teeth on the brush as it will to um, the teeth on the connector so um, you can go with a modest amount of force on those contacts and all the tarnish has come off I can see uh, clean, clean bare metal underneath uh, they're not polished but they're certainly conductive in a way that they weren't before um, just returning to the dial face for a moment this piece of perspex that you can see just here is the calibration adjustment for um, the 100 kilohertz oscillator now just to review the 100 kilohertz oscillator uh, produces a lot of harmonics which produce this uh, picket fence effect across the HF band and you can tune the radio to each one of those uh, and then set the calibration marker correctly onto the well in this case it's the 6.7 megahertz uh, calibration point and once you've set that um, then the uh, reading that you will get for a good 100 kilohertz or so either side of that uh, calibration point uh, should be reasonably accurate so this is a, an old school way of calibrating your dial and um, what was concerning me about this piece of perspex was that it, it appeared to be um, crazed in the same way that the uh, acetate windows were crazed now I haven't found a replacement for the acetate windows but I was very gratified to find that this was not crazed it was just dirty and what I used on it was this material uh, this substance it's just metal polish nothing fancy about it and a clean cloth 
and that got the um, deposit and grease and what have you off that. There is a, a small amount of crazing on that piece of perspex, uh, but not so much that I need to fabricate a new one, which was the alternative in this case. I had considered doing it, I thought, well, there's an afternoon's work, but it turns out I don't have to do that at all, so that's good. The final um, piece of work that I've done uh, so far is this, which is the antenna input connector. I was contemplating using an SO239, um, but an SO239 wouldn't have fit, um, and as it turns out, I didn't have one. But I did have a 75 ohm BNC connector. Now that's a pretty good substitute, it was a good fit. Um, the only thing I had to do was I cut a piece of phenolic printed circuit board and I inserted it just in here um, and that enabled me to drill the correct size hole for the connector and that centred the connector more accurately in the hole uh, in the, um, the front panel. So that was a good move. I've also soldered a piece of wire to the back of that phenolic circuit board and soldered the other end to the chassis as close as I could possibly get it and I now have a strong electrical bond between the body of the connector and the chassis right next to the input filter uh, which is precisely what you want. And apart from that I have not made any modifications to this radio whatsoever. So it's a pity because the previous owner could have done that just as easily as I did but obviously didn't think to or didn't have the resources to, to go about that. So, the next step with this is to apply 24 volts to it. Uh, I've got to do a little bit of an analysis on the terminals in the Jones connector at the back, but I can apply 24 volts to it and I'm expecting to see the filaments and the dial lights light up. Um, if that's all fine and dandy, then I can look at applying 250 volts to the rest of the circuit and see if it actually converts one frequency to another. So, um, I think that's it for this session. Uh, thank you again for taking an interest, and uh, I'll see you next time round. BK3ZVX, 73s to everyone.